My name is uh, Stuart Swift. Uh, I uh, uh, live in Litchfield, South Carolina. Before World War II, I was a high school student uh, living in Washington, D.C., the District of Columbia, where my father worked for the federal government. He was an, an administrative law judge with the SEC. Uh, everybody, of course, in my class, I graduated from high school. In June of 1943, I'd already enlisted in the Army Air Corps as an aviation cadet, but they were not calling people. The Army was not accepting people, unlike the Navy, until they were 18. So I waited three months until they called me into service as an aviation cadet. Uh, I went immediately with uh, a number of just turned 18-year-olds uh, to Greensboro, North Carolina, where we undertook basic training, which was about a 12-week course, uh, where they made soldiers out of us. And uh, every day, 5 a.m. in the morning until 5 o'clock at night, and then lights out at 9, uh, they be we became soldiers that way. Lots of drilling, physical education, marching, uh, that sort of thing. Only trouble was about halfway through that, the Army now this was the Army Air Corps. The Air Corps was part of the Army in those days. And uh, the top ranks in the Army Air Corps decided that they had enough, at that time, pilot trainees. Bearing in mind, this was October 1943. They had too many aviation cadets, so they washed us all out, all of us that were in training there. I wound up in a, a small contingent. We went out to Denver, Colorado and learned how to be office soldiers, and most of us didn't care for that. Uh, but uh, so they changed their plans with us then, and first thing we knew, we were on a troop train heading back, headed back east uh, to Camp Kilmer, New Jersey, where we were uh, processed and loaded aboard a British troop ship. And by that time, it was the calendar had advanced until it was February 1944. About 10,000 of us went aboard an aging British uh, Cunard passenger liner, and we left New York City. And somewhere off the coast, we joined a convoy. Our ship was not fast enough to travel alone with, without escort. So we joined a, convo a convoy of perhaps two or 300 other ships. Maybe there, maybe there were other troop ships. I don't know. These were other freighters carrying war material, things like that. Uh, February, the Atlantic could be kind of rough. We were traveling in convoy, which meant that we could not travel any faster than the slowest ship. We went to Europe by way of Iceland, the northern route. It took us 22 days to, to meet, to reach Liverpool, where we were offloaded and, and did some further traveling around the Brit Great Britain. Uh, uh, over to really the North Sea, where they were decided to billet us for a while until they decided what to do was where each of us would go and fit into Air Corps ground uh, ground operation. I wound up in a uh, an Air Force. Well, it was the Ninth Air Force over in the south of England. They were the the tactical Air Force rather than the Eighth Air Force, which bore the burden of the heavy bombardment. Uh, uh, a strategic air force, if you will. Uh, they had me first driving a gasoline truck, uh, servicing the fighter planes as they would come in, filling them, refilling them. At times when that was not needed, they had me uh, out uh, as an armorer, which was putting the, the, the belt ammunition into these fighter planes between missions. Uh, that lasted for quite a while until fall of about, I guess it would have been 1944, that was the same year I went over in, when uh, uh, the fighting had really eaten into the supply of uh, uh, experienced soldiers over. We had already landed in, in, on the coast of France at that time, and they needed replacements real quick. And so they raided the Air Force and took about 50,000 of us, taught us how to be soldiers again, uh, marching, carrying heavy packs, operating an M1 rifle, 
And in six weeks, we were on our way to the continent. And uh, I wound up in the 75th Division, which had just uh, been committed over to the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, and uh, coldest weather I'd ever soldiered in. And uh, I uh, had frostbite on both feet, but I got over that. And uh, by that time, we were, the 75th had just uh, gotten into line up there after Patton's 3rd Army troops had cleared the Germans away in the Battle of the Bulge. And we got up to the Rhine River. Uh, the bridge at, uh, at Remagen had, already, had fallen in. We were using it for a while, so they, they had to transport us across the Rhine in rubber boats. That was a real experience. And there we went into Germany, up into the Ruhr Valley. Uh, to clean up what, what the, the retreating Germans had left behind, I mean, in the way of fighting men. Uh, one horrific thing that, that impressed us most, I, I was no stranger to seeing men killed, shot, and uh, blood, if you will. I was I've never been particularly squeamish about blood, but uh, it wasn't a pleasant thing, but as we got into the Ruhr Valley, the Germans had taken a lot of their captured uh, civilian populations, that is, the foreigners like the Ukrainians, Polish, Czechoslovakian, and had transported them into Germany as forced labor. But as the war went on and went toward a close, these people, uh, they could, the factories were being bombed and destroyed by the 8th Air Force, these people were no good to them anymore, so they just uh, stopped feeding them, and thousands of them starved to death. And when we broke into the camp at Belzen, there were pro approximately 5,000 people there that had been starved to death. They were stacked up like cordwood. Uh, that was about one of the most horrific things I think I'd ever seen. Uh, the war ended after that very soon, and our division being uh, new, to the fighting, we remained as an army of occupation. And uh, uh, we first got uh, into repatriating uh, a lot of Germans, uh, the German soldiers. There were massive numbers of German prisoners of war, which had to be fed and classified. And we saw that these people got back to their, their homes in time. Uh, one of the probably more uh, interesting things of that. There were a lot of Austrians that were there fighting with the Germans and we were repatriating them down to Salzburg and we traveled over the Autobahn and which gave us a, a nice sightseeing trip down there past uh, uh, into the Bavarian area of Germany and into Austria uh, at, uh, well r the entry point being Salzburg. Uh, we stayed there for a while, rested from our trip and then back into our camps up in northern Germany where uh, all of the Germans had been repatriated by that time and we were then shipped over to France where we began uh, processing American troops to the Far East. The Japanese, of course, remained to be uh, dealt with. This was before the dropping of the atomic bomb. And uh, uh, that was a kind of a dull situation, but uh, it had to be done. and. The, the biggest thing about some of these jobs after the war was boredom. It was a very boring type of situation. Uh, most of us were homesick, very badly homesick by that time. And we were, uh, we were kind of light on overseas service, and so only the ones that had been there the longest got to go home first, which was the, uh, the just thing to do. But uh, uh, eventually, uh, uh, our day came and we were shipped back to the United States. Uh, we traveled uh, in a more uh, uh, seaworthy and a more comfortable ship going home, a U.S. Navy troop ship, and uh, we made it home in about six days <laughs> as compared to the 22 going over in midwinter. But uh, we landed in New York. We went back to Camp Kilmer again, which was the place that we had exited the country. And uh, for myself, my family by, at that time were living in Philadelphia. And so they shipped me down to Fort Dix, which is very close by on the Jersey side of the Delaware River. 
and uh, uh, there was a delay in pro processing us out of the Army. One particularly funny thing was I went to, I got a pass to go and visit my parents in Philadelphia, but, on my, but I had to come back to the base. A couple of MPs picked me up on, on the train. My pass had not been filled out. And immediately I was suspect of being a deserter or, or AWOL, absent without leave. They took me down to the stockade in, in South Philadelphia, and I thought I was going to miss my discharge. <laughs> but uh, uh, they made some phone calls and got me out and put me back on the train again up to uh, Camp Kilmer. But, uh, but that was the story of, uh, in a nutshell, of two and a half years' service. Under fire, yes, the answer is yes, yes, but not extensively. We were fighting German second-line troops. Uh, Volks, the, the Volkssturm, I think the, the, these are senior citizens uh, that were out doing their best to repel the Allied invasion, and they were not very tough to deal with. Uh, not a whole lot of fighting. Once we crossed the Rhine River, we, we took some fire, but uh, that's about the extent of it. It, it wasn't... Uh, the, as I say, the worst part of my service in that part of the war was the liberation of these camps of displaced persons who, who worked as slave labor and who in the end were starved to death. The Germans had a special hate for the Jews. They took them to the death camps out in Eastern Europe, Poland, uh, Eastern Germany, uh, where they were processed and, uh, and put in the they, were, they, ga they gassed these people to death and then burned them. Uh, these people were Polish, Hungarian, Czechoslovakian, um, Romanian, Yugoslavian. They were people that were imported into Germany after the Germans had conquered these, these countries and they used them as slave labor. All of the available uh, German males were, became part of the German army and these people were were put into uh, war, war. They taught them how to build airplanes. Uh, they taught them how to build trucks, tanks, everything having to do with the war. Uh, slave labor. And, uh, but when the war was over, uh, or, or when the Germans perceived that the war was coming to an end, these people, they could no longer, they, they no lo longer felt it worthwhile to feed these people, and so they starved them to death. They kept them there, but uh, they slowly. Most of these people were dead. We did save a few of them. For some of the more, let's say, uh, uh, vigorous ones did survive starvation. And of course, we, br we brought a lot of food in and, put the, and tried to rehabilitate these people. And the Army did the best they could. We were sharing our rations with them, but most of them were stacked up like cordwood. And this was, this was a ghastly sight. I'd, I'd never seen this before. And we, these people were mostly in such bad condition, they were unidentifiable. And I'm sure, I never saw this, but I'm sure we, we put them into crematoriums and, and burned them. Uh, there was so little left of them. So but that's the extent of, this is, was, was the bad part of, of the, uh, it was the most horrific part of my service. couldn't believe it because being a younger soldier uh, I knew I was headed that way as soon as we finished getting all the active troops out of Germany and aboard ships see we didn't we didn't transfer our soldiers by air in those days you know today when we with the the big planes that we have today we we, uh, we use large transport planes they were these guys were shipping out to the Far East on troop ships and uh, uh, but of course, we were awfully happy that, that that part of the war was coming to an end, but most of us knew that we were still going to have to fight the Japs. And uh, it was, there was just unbridled joy, you might say, at the fact that that part of the war was over and that at least uh, perhaps it might be over insofar as my me, myself, was concerned uh, that we, maybe it would be over, maybe it would be over. This is before we knew that the atomic bomb existed, but uh, it was, 
perhaps by the time we got rid of, uh, of moving vast numbers of troops out of Europe to the Pacific Theater, that maybe we wouldn't have to go over there. So it was better than going over there and fighting. We, I'd seen just enough of the fighting not to want to do it. I wasn't really enthusiastic about fighting Japs. <laughs>
I could have stayed and become a, uh, an Air Force pilot or if flunking pilot training, you could have become a bombardier or a navigator or something like that, or even a gunner. It was sure better than walking, marching with a pack on your back in the, in the cold of Germany in the wintertime. But, uh, but, you know, the Eighth Air Force, I mean, just to mention one, one uh, part of the, uh, the total war effort, they took some horrible losses over Germany. They, they, their raids generally went to, from 900 to 1,000 planes, and sometimes they took 10% losses. Uh, the German, uh, and we did, at that time we did not have fighter planes that, that could take them all the way to their targets. And that's why we built the P-51, which was a, a long-range plane, and uh, it saved uh, some of our losses in the, in the later months of the German, of, of the air war against Germany. But uh, those guys took a real, uh, Percentage-wise, I would say that the Air Force probably suffered greater casualties than the, inf than the infantry did. Percentage-wise. The, the capture of Iwo Jima brought, them, brought us just close enough to make it an effective range for the fighter planes to stay with the B-29 bombers going in there. I became, in two and a half years service in the Army, I became a corporal. That's two stripes. The only thing was, when a lot of our senior men left our company, uh, I finally got wound up to be acting first sergeant of my company. That's the guy with two, th three on top and three rockers below with a diamond in the middle. I was doing that job, but uh, I asked the captain one time, I said, why can't you at least make me a buck sergeant? He says, there are, abs there are no more promotions this side of the ocean. Cheer up, my lads. It was a song. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but that was the story of my life. Uh, it would have been nice to have had that extra pay. I hope it has. It's not very glamorous uh, uh, that uh, uh, these, these fellows that were real active soldiers, uh, uh, and lived through it, and did, and Bill, I don't, as far as I'm, as I can remember, I said, Bill used to be my boss. Uh, uh, he went through all of that. He landed on, he was in a couple of landings out there. He was not at Iwo Jima, but he was at Palalu, I think, and also Saipan, maybe. And uh, he never even got a Purple Heart out of it, which is good. That means you didn't shed any blood. But uh, I am. Uh, uh, Feel that I was lucky. I, can't, I stayed shy of the of the heavy fighting <laughs> until the, the the infantry and Patton and his tanks had, and I, I really uh, broke out. And and the only thing that probably made the war last longer than it did was the fact that Patton and his tanks ran out of ran out of gasoline. They had to stop them. Uh, and our, our Logistics had not uh, improved to the extent that they needed to improve. To kept, Patton could have gone all the way to the Rhine River, I think, uh, because the Germans were in complete disarray. He was always ahead of the curve, and that for slapping that soldier, which was an unfortunate thing down in Sicily, that impeded his. Uh, it, 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 it kind of destroyed his career for a while. But we had a lot of good soldiers. I mean, Brad, Omar Bradley was there. Uh, I, I met him one time in later years in my job. I worked for the railroad, same as Bill Johnston did. And uh, uh, terrific, he was a terrific person, I thought. And uh, uh, Omar Bradley became later, I, I think he maybe became chief of staff, and then he went over to, the, to run the the Veterans Administration, I think, for a while. Just like the, there's a brand new uh, Veterans Administrator right now, General Shinseki, I think, has just been appointed. The Red Ball Express trucks, six by six trucks, uh, working from the beachhead uh, to Paris. Uh, they. Uh, 
they did sort of a good job, but they couldn't bring the they couldn't bring the quantities of gasoline that needed to come through. And it's not it wasn't only gasoline; it was, it was ammunition. Really, we we needed uh, ammunition for those guns that the soldiers were shooting. And uh, one thing that that kind of slowed us down, if we can back up to the Normandy beaches, after D-Day, uh, we decided, I mean, we began, we kept pouring troops across the beaches there at Normandy, but we needed a port uh, where we could bring a lot of heavy duty stuff in. And that's when we decided to go after Cherbourg, and, uh, which was up uh, a little bit to the west of the, of the Normandy beaches. And uh, we, it took us a while. The Germans perceived this, I think, and they, they made a pretty stout defense of Cherbourg. And, but we finally captured, which gave, gave us a deep water port where we could bring uh, uh, troops, ammunition, supplies, every, all the logistics of war in over a, a real honest-to-goodness port. And the Germans thought we were headed for San Isaire and Lorient, where they had their submarine pens. We, we thought of that, but... Uh, what happened after we got to, after we captured Cherbourg was uh, we never went after those sub pens down there. We put troops there and we isolated them from the land and then just kept bombing them. Uh, and uh, they were pretty well hardened facilities. And, uh, and the German submarines were, were still uh, uh, active for a good part of the war. You know, on our trip over, one thing I didn't mention, probably one of the most fearsome things that I had to contend with in that slow-moving convoy, we must have lost five or six ships. You know, the Navy was escorting us, and they were particularly screening our troop ship with their, so that the Germans couldn't put a, a torpedo or two into our ship. But, uh, but other ships were getting blown up. And it was to, watch, to, to have a grandstand seat on the decks of this troop ship and watch these uh, freighters go down, it was, it was a rather fearsome thing to watch. And, our escorts were doing the very best they could, mostly British uh, uh, corvettes and, and destroyers. But uh, they did the best that they could, but it wasn't. Uh, war is a tough business. Uh, we were told that the ships, the navies, uh, the, uh, the British Navy, and there were, there were U.S. Navy ships there. They, they did their job as best they could, but they had to, they had to go after the subs. Uh, and we, you know, our, our detection equipment wasn't quite, in those days, as good as it is now or later on in the war, but, uh, but uh, that's the price we pay sometimes. And, uh, the, these were, uh, as far as I know, there were no ship, troop ships that went down. These were all freighters carrying war material, things like that. But uh, it, was a, it was a large sized convoy. We went, we went by way of Iceland, as I told you, but it took us 22 days to reach Liverpool. Very rough seas, very rough seas. I was just a kid, and I was not doing that. I was really fighting for my life, really. I wasn't looking at the, the philosophy of war and all that. But uh, I came back and, and went through four years of college on the GI Bill of Rights. And uh, uh, I got a lot of support from home, too. My, my dad was a judge, a lawyer. And uh, uh, he made sure that uh, when I was at home, before I went away to the war, that a lot of the programming, we didn't have television in those days, but lots of news programs and uh, things of that. And they, it, it's, it, it's just a matter of the kind of a culture you grew up in, I think. I think our soldiers were a, kind of a different kind of people, most of our soldiers were, and uh, as compared to the people in European armies. Uh, at least this is, this is my impression, and we did what we could. You know, I was, not that I felt sorry for the Germans, but uh, most German cities were just leveled. I mean, we didn't use the bomb site as we kept talking about bomb sites for precision bombing. We used carpet bombing. The, the RAF taught us about that and uh, in their night raids. And uh, uh, the cities were just flattened. How more people didn't? How more people were not killed? Uh, I talked a lot to German people. We got quite a well, quite well acquainted, and of course they dug pretty deep. I mean, their, their air raid shelters, but the cities were just leveled. 
They were trashed. I, I was not horrified, but it, it was a surprising thing to see that. And the Germans recovered very, very quickly from it. They were hardworking people. And uh, uh, they, uh, and of course, we had to bring a lot of foodstuffs in to, to feed the German populace. And we did it. And, and we did a lot of other stuff with the Marshall Plan, of course. We, we, we rebuilt their industry using grade A technology. Steel companies were rebuilt that could make better steel than American companies could make. And the same thing happened in Japan. And these are people that killed us economically later on. We're running into the same thing right now in the Gaza Strip. The Israelis have been taking a lot of indiscriminate rocket fire. And so they decided to put a stop to it. And the only way to do it is to go in and eradicate these people that are giving them so much misery. It doesn't, that's, that's, that's another factor. Our, our country has to defend itself. And uh, you can, t the news media, they pick up on this thing from Guantanamo. Uh, sure, in the, process, in, in, the, in the process of interviewing these prisoners down there, some of the uh, interviewers get a little bit rough with people. And uh, I, don't, I don't think we should actually torture people. But sometimes they have to slap them around a little bit. And police do that in this country, even, with witnesses that they think where well, they have a good, uh, a good cause. I mean, they have, a, they have a, a live subject. I'm a retired person. I work for the railroad industry. Uh, been retired 20 years now. Uh, enjoy living in South Carolina. I live in Litchfield at 212 Goodson Loop. And uh, I hope to live there for a good many more years.